Hello, my name is Beth Stevens, and I'm an HHMI investigator at Boston Children's Hospital and the Broad Institute. And my lab is largely interested in understanding how the immune system helps sculpt developing neural circuits. Now, from the time I was a graduate student, I've been fascinated by glial cells, the non-neuronal cells of the brain. But even as a card-carrying glial biologist, I've largely ignored the cell I'm going to tell you about today, microglia, our resident immune cells. Now, there are many reasons for that, but it largely was in part because we really lack the tools in which to study these cells until fairly recently. We now know that microglia, our resident phagocytes and immune cells, play central roles in both brain development, function, and dysfunction in disease. They make up about 7 to 10 percent of the cells in our brain. And despite being described over 100 years ago by Rio Ortega, we're only now beginning to understand their dynamic functions in the brain. Now, we've known for quite some time they play a key role when the brain is injured or in the context of disease. Microglia change dramatically in the context of, of even local perturbations in the brain. They largely are these beautiful cells that have these dynamic processes that you can't quite appreciate from this image. But under the context of injury and disease, they can dramatically change shape. They become more phagocytic in many cases. And they are known to play key roles in neuroinflammation by releasing molecules like cytokines into the brain. They're also known as our resident phagocytes to be very good at clearing pathogens and debris. And moreover, they can remove local and toxic proteins in the brain. Now, these functions, which have been described for many years, are both detrimental and beneficial depending on the context. But what we're now appreciating is the fact that these cells play far more diverse roles than we previously appreciated. And this, again, is because until recently we lacked tools to study them in detail. One of the things that really has cracked open the field is new reporter uh, transgenic lines, like this one that I'm showing you, that was developed by Stefan Young a number of years ago. This is a mouse that's been genetically engineered to express EGFP, this fluorescent green protein, in all the microglia and myeloid cells. And using this tool, researchers can look at microglia in the uh, developing or adult or even diseased brain and watch these cells in action. And this is in large part due to the fact that we can do two-photon imaging by making these thin cranial windows and put a microscope over these fluorescent green mice. And using these tools, a number of pioneers in the field really were the first to start to make some of these really fundamental new observations about microglia that certainly changed the way I've been thinking about them. So Axel Nimeron and Demetrios Davalos and Wen Biao Gan were some of these pioneers that started to do imaging experiments like I just described. So as I mentioned, microglia are really good at eating or engulfing things. Uh, they can rapidly clear debris or dead cells in the brain, and they respond really dramatically to injury. And this is illustrated by an experiment that Axel Nimeron did a number of years ago. And this was enabled by the fact that, again, using this reporter line, this green GFP fractokine receptor mouse that was crossed to a neuronal reporter line where the neurons are labeled in red, what Axel did is in the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, he made a little laser injury to that red neuron. And what you can see from this movie is that the microglia re dramatically responding to that local injury and engulfing or pulling up the parts of that, that neuron after the injury. Now, this is a very dramatic example, but this just illustrates their ability to phagocytose through the uh, expression of a lot of different phagocytic receptors. Now, in addition to phagocytosis, as I mentioned, uh, microglia are incredibly dynamic. The processes in particular are constantly surveying the brain environment and uh, in the brain parenchyma. And these experiments, again, that were first done by these pioneers showed that by just looking at microglia under normal conditions in the brain, you can see their fine processes moving. But if you were to make an injury, in this case with a laser, the microglia dramatically move and extend their processes toward the injury, as shown here. Now, this is really um, rapidly uh, happening, although it's quite sped up in this movie. But you can see the fine processes chemoattracting to the injury site. And it's been shown now that one of the signals released that actually brings the microglia to the site of injury are ATP, or pure, they have purinergic receptors that recognize the signal. But this is just one example of under 
under a real acute injury what microglia look like. Okay, so microglia not only respond when things go wrong, but two photon imaging like this has revealed that microglia are constantly surveying the brain environment with their, their fine processes. So the question, of course, is what is it that they're surveying? What are the signals that are regulating their motility? And although you can't see the cells underneath there, what signals are they using to communicate with neurons and other cells to regulate synapse and brain development? So microglia are indeed integral parts of brain circuitry. Over the last many years, more and more evidence is, is suggesting that microglia actively signal with neurons and synapses, but also with other glial cells, where they play critical roles in brain development and plasticity and function. Now, what we also appreciate is that microglia are the only cell not born in the brain. A recent work, um, bait mapping study by Miriam Murad's lab in uh, Florent Genou a number of years ago, did some really important um, fate mapping studies and showed that microglia actually derive from the yolk sac as uh, myeloid progenitor cells. They enter the brain quite early in development, and then once they're in the brain, they're exposed to brain signals, they become known as what we call resident microglial cells, and they differentiate into these cells that I just mentioned, these surveying microglia that mature over the first several weeks of development. Now, we know that these microglia have many different functions, uh, many more that I'm probably going to tell you about today that we're just beginning to unearth. But in particular, even before birth, there's been evidence to suggest that microglia are critically important in neurogenesis. For example, as resident phagocytes, they actually help to clear and phagocytose newborn neurons. And there's actually even some evidence that they can engulf um, neurons without clear evidence of apoptosis. So some of those signals have been identified. There's also evidence to suggest that microglia release signals such as chemokines and cytokines that are also important in regulating not just neurogenesis, but different aspects of neuronal differentiation during development. And there's also evidence um, to suggest that axons, uh, that microglia are also dynamically regulating the refinement and ref pruning back of these uh, developing axon tracts before birth, and that they can also uh, regulate the um, fate and the outcome of, of certain subtypes of inner neurons um, in the adult brain. So this is all happening during our embryonic development. But of course, after birth, more and more evidence points to the fact that these cells are playing key roles in myelination, so they can regulate the process of myelination, but also the, uh, the, the process of um, oligodendrocyte differentiation. Um, they're involved in synaptic development, synaptic maturation, and synaptic plasticity. And they're also key regulators in synaptic remodeling or synaptic pruning, which I'll tell you more about today. So this suggests that microglia are existing in specialized states. And we, as I mentioned before, these, these cells are obviously dynamically associating with synapses. And this is now illustrated in this movie where we can overlay a microglia in green with uh, neurons that are labeled in red. And this led to the observation that these microglia are dynamically interacting with subsets of synapses, spines and axons, especially during developmental critical periods. These cells are incredibly dynamic. And they're, as I'll tell you, uh, are particularly phagocytic in times and places of synaptic remodeling, which is a, a normal developmental process that's happening over the first weeks of life. Um, uh, and, and so the question is, could microglia uh, be involved in this process of synaptic refinement or synaptic pruning? Now, synaptic pruning is, uh, as I mentioned, a normal developmental process in which excess synapses or connections are permanently removed while others get strengthened and maintained. They happen over, this process happens over different critical periods. Um, so there are parts of your brain and like sensory systems that are, that are pruned relatively early in development. But there are some parts of our brain, like the frontal cortex, that continue to prune and remodel into early adulthood. And so the question is, you know, could microglia play a role in this process? And when you look at microglia morphology and you start to characterize some of the markers they express, we notice pretty early on that during um, this developmental critical period of pruning, microglia were particularly phagocytic, meaning they expressed a lot of phagocytic receptors. They had more lysosomal activity at these periods where they're associating with synapses. And in the mouse visceral system, the model system that we've been using, um, we provided evidence 
that microglia are in fact engulfing some of these um, axons or inputs during development. This is a 3D uh, surface rendering of a microglia from the visual thalamus, for example, during its critical period of remodeling. And Dorothy Schaefer in my lab showed that most of the microglia at this time of eye segregation in the visual thalamus were engulfing large numbers of these presynaptic inputs, which could also be shown by EM. Um, and it was happening again during this window of development, and they, they largely decreased their ability to engulf synapses after that critical period, raising the question about what's the signals that are instructing microglia to engulf synapses, and are there even more specifically signals that are telling microglia to engulf specific synapses, for example, the less active inputs during development. And as I mentioned, you know, this is an activity-dependent process. How do microglia know which synapse to prune and which synapse to, to leave alone? Raising the question that they may be some sort of cues or instructive signals that are recruiting microglia to certain synapses or inputs. And there may also be signals that are telling microglia not to engulf certain synapses or inputs. So one of the signals that we have been focused on and that we identified a number of years ago was a group of molecules called complement, um, which was a group of innate immune molecules well studied in the innate immune system in the periphery. These are eat me signals that are known to tag apoptotic cells or debris. Um, and that they're a way that circulating macrophages in the periphery recognize these apoptotic cells. So essentially, these, these proteins bind or opsonize the surface of these, the surface of membrane of these cells and, and tell the, the macrophages to engulf them. Now, in the brain, what we discovered when I was a postdoc in Ben Barris's lab is that a large number of these secreted complement molecules were actually expressed in the healthy brain by neurons and glial cells. Um, especially the microglia were making a lot of C1Q, for example, that initiating protein of the cascade. And that many of these molecules were actually binding to um, subsets of these developing synapses. And importantly, microglia are the only resident cell to express the receptors for these complement molecules, or CR3, for example. So in the immune system, as I mentioned, complement is tagging a bacterial cell for elimination that's recruiting macrophages, which express complement receptors. And what we discovered is that the brain, in the brain, especially in the healthy brain, complement molecules are, are binding to or localizing to synapses and axons. And this is mediating the engulfment of those inputs through complement receptors. And so what we went on to show was that if you knock out either the molecules complement, the secreted molecules, or the receptor on microglia, there were defects in synapse elimination. And that microglia, at least in the visual system, were only about half as good at engulfing these synapses. Now, this is just one example of a group of molecules that, we, um, that are instructive in, in synaptic pruning in this circuit. But work over the last many years by many labs have identified more and more signals, some secreted, some surface-bound molecules, both by microglia and the neurons and other glial cells, that are contributing to different aspects of, of both brain development and synaptic refinement. I just illustrated a few here. And more importantly, um, which I want to touch on briefly, it's, it's, it raises also the question of, of whether or not, in the context of disease, where there's aberrant synaptic loss and, and activation of microglia and, and other immune-related pathways, could some of these same pathways and mechanisms that normally function to uh, regulate brain development, could they go awry and become dysregulated in the context of brain injury and disease? And indeed, many of these molecules, including TREM2, APOE, these are actually molecules or proteins that are also risk genes for diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And we now appreciate from emerging genetics that a large number of the late onset Alzheimer's risk genes are expressed or enriched in microglia or myeloid cells. And that really does change the way we're thinking about these cells in the context of these diseases, not just as playing a secondary role, but actually may even be uh, driving some of the, 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 the disease in the context of at least Alzheimer's disease. Um, for example, TREM2 and some of the complement uh, genes as well. So this raises the question, how do microglia contribute to disease? When do they contribute? And these are really challenging questions to address, obviously, in human disease, because we really do lack the tools to be able to both manipulate and label and track microglia changes over the course of disease, especially non-invasively. But even in fixed tissue, we don't have very good markers that denote all these different functional states that I just told you about.
So imagine if we had a signature that denoted a microglia that was undergoing phagocytosis during neurogenesis or synaptic pruning and differentiating it from a microglia that was pruning a plaque versus aberrantly pruning synapses. Right now, when these microglia change state, we don't really have markers that denote the beneficial versus the detrimental states in the brain. Even inflammation, we call these inflammatory states, but more than likely this represents many different substates or subpopulations, and even then, uh, inflammation could be both beneficial or detrimental depending upon the context and the cues. So this really um, is raising the, both the challenge, but also the fact that we now are in a position to start to develop new tools to be able to start to track these different states. How heterogeneous are microglia? How diverse are they? How many states really even exist? Before we can understand their role in Alzheimer's disease, we thought maybe we should step back and start to ask how many states exist under normal development across the lifespan of a mouse, and what can we infer about their function, and how do these, states, these microglia states change in the context of disease? So to address this question, we've been applying a new technology that many in the field, of course, are using called single cell sequencing, um, uh, initially developed by Steve McCarroll, my collaborator at VivraGev and Evan Macosco. Now it's a technology that many are using routinely, but we applied this a um, number of years ago, and I should say Tim Hammond and Connor in my lab in collaboration with Steve's lab, decided to use single cell sequencing to assess microglia diversity across the lifespan of a mouse. And to do that, and, and you may recall that microglia only represent between 7 and 10 percent of the cells in the brain, so that also involved having to develop new methods to both um, dissociate and purify and, and isolate microglia only from the brains, from many, many mice. In fact, uh, they ended up profiling 78,000 microglia across 41 mice. Um, and using these um, approaches that Tim and Connor developed to purify the microglia, we put them through a 10x or single cell sequencing. And in this way, we can start to ask, how diverse are they? And the take home of that, this is a summary of, of Tim's paper, but also a, a very, a very um, consistent results were observed in a study by Ben Barris's lab, which is that there's a lot of diversity during development. By about one month, at least in a mouse, they're largely homogeneous, one big population. But then in the context of aging, pathology, there's a shift in some of these states. And this is the data just to illustrate an example of that, where you can actually, um, we looked at all of the, the data put together in these TSNE plots, and we started looking at what the different clusters or the different populations of microglia were. What were the genes in those different clusters? And in particular, cluster four, uh, emerged only during development, during this postnatal period. And um, this particular cluster or state of microglia expressed genes like osteopontin or SPP1, IGF1, LPL, and others. And these are interesting because they're the same um, signatures that are coming up in some of these disease-associated states in Alzheimer's and other diseases, yet we were seeing them in a small population of microglia only during development. And using, and, and interestingly, these and other genes in this cluster uh, suggested immune recognition, lysosomal activity, phagocytosis. And so to ask where do these microglia um, exist in the brain, um, Connor and Tim did um, spatial mapping and multiplex in situ hybridization. They made probes for these markers and then found, quite excitingly, that the, um, these microglia in cluster four were largely um, localized to developing white matter tracts and nowhere else. And that, of course, opened up lots of interesting questions. Um, could these special axon-associated microglia be important in myelination, axonal refinement, other aspects of refinement of these white matter tracts that we're, we're not yet um, thinking about? And so using some of these tools, we're now in a position to start to manipulate and deplete and knock out just these specific cluster 4 microglia to start to interrogate function of these cells. And we're taking a similar approach, and, and as our other in the field, to start to use the single cell data to try to, try, try to link changes in transcription to specific functions of microglia. I gave you one example, these axon tract associated microglia. I don't think we necessarily would have found this, this particular population had we not done the single cell sequencing, but this is now giving us signature and markers to start to use as tools to start to manipulate specific states of microglia. And I think this uh, approach, by combining single cell and spatial mapping and functional studies, 
are going to enable the field to ask a number of fundamental questions. What are the functions of these different populations in different contexts? Can we start to model, faithfully model microglia? Can we, how do the genetic mutations and variants influence microglia states? How do we link genetics to function? And ultimately, can we use this information to target and track microglia in di across disease progression? And I think this really is sort of where I want to wrap up, is that I do think that we're, we're in an exciting time in the field. But again, without understanding the normal functions of these cells, it's going to be really challenging to try to understand how they go awry in these complex disorders, especially given the diversity and, and, and heterogeneity of these microglia in the brain. So we want to be able to develop new tools to identify and track microglia populations. We want to be able to use this information to target the detrimental states, for example, of microglia and different diseases. And we ultimately hope that maybe someday digging deeply into the biology could unveil new biomarkers or maybe even new therapeutic targets that we could, we could use to start to, um, to manipulate microglia. So I'll end there by thanking the human microglia in my lab that made a lot of the work I told you about today possible, and also uh, a lot of really terrific um, collaborators and lab members, both past and present. So thanks very much.